Well, hi, everybody. Really glad to be here. Um, we've been here lots of times, but maybe you haven't been here when we've been here. I'm Mark Gallagher. My wife, Sue, is right down. I lost her. There she is. Uh, right down there. <laughs> I saw a, a Scott, saw Scott Shipman, who preached here last week, and said he had trouble seeing everybody. But I can see you. I've gotten adjusted to it. Hi, Roberta. So I, I'm good. If I can see Roberta on the back row, I'm all right. Really glad to be here this morning. Uh, Sue and I just finished 40 years of ministry with Christian Student Fellowship yesterday, and I'm officially retired, And uh, which is a nice way of saying I'm unemployed. So anyway, uh, one of the things that uh, I loved most about our ministry was being able to preach and teach. There are lots of things I won't miss, but that's one thing that uh, was really special to us, and, and I'm glad that I get to do that. Glad to be here this morning. I, I'm not here to promote CSF, but I do want to tell you one thing. Uh, Adam and Aaron Caldwell are going to take over. They've been with us for 11 years, and I know you folks have been very supportive for a long, long time. Uh, Seth and Amber Passfield. Uh, our really active Seth that's on the board of directors. And uh, I, I just want to encourage you guys. The ministry is still, oh, hi, Randy. I see you now. Um, but uh, I just want you to know the ministry is still the same. We're just not there. And I want to encourage you. It's a really vital ministry. I want you to go ahead and turn into your uh, Bibles in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And... Um, we're going to talk about a real mess. The church at Corinth, and if you've done much reading about this church at Corinth, I'm going to move this down because every time I put my head down, I I make noise. But the church of Corinth was a real mess. And if you uh, know anything about it, if you've done much reading in there, uh, you can tell right off the bat that Paul is not pleased with how things are going on Uh, In Corinth, they are a mess. There's all kinds of things wrong with them. There's division within the church to start with. Uh, They're divided over everything. Uh, Some of the things that Paul highlights in these 16 chapters of 1 Corinthians is the fact that they were divided over spiritual leaders. They all had their favorites. And you know, we're like that in the church sometimes too. We have those who we prefer. But the problem was they were dividing over them. Paul, some were saying, well, I'm of Paul. Others were saying, well, I'm of Cephas. And then the real spiritual ones said, well, I'm of Christ. And, 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 but they were divisive in these things. Uh, they were divided by social status. There were rich people, there were poor people. And the rich people just kept getting richer. And the poor people just kept getting poorer. Uh, they're divided over spiritual gifts. They didn't understand the spiritual gifts were designed to enhance the church, to build up the church. They thought of spiritual gifts as something that will make them feel spiritual, something that will make them look important, and so divided. There's immorality within the church. All kinds of sexual misconduct is being tolerated in the church, every variety. Some, Paul said, you don't even see among the pagans. He was deeply disturbed about that. And he was most disturbed by the fact that the church leaders and the congregation were even tolerating it within their body. Um, Had a problem with women rebelling. Not that Paul was ever one to put down women. He raises them high. But the women were rebelling and acting a lot like the temple prostitutes. Um, Some were getting drunk at their love feasts while others went hungry. So this church is, it's a mess. Division, immorality, and there's a lot of confusion. One of the things that happens when you stray away from the authority of God and the things of God is you're ripe for confusion. Um, There was confusion about marriage. Uh, Well, can I marry? Who should I marry? Uh, what happens if my spouse dies? What, after my, what happens if my spouse, my spouse leaves me? Uh, lots of confusion there. There was confusion regarding 
food being sacrificed to idols. Idols were part and parcel of the Roman Empire and the Greek culture before that. They had idols for everything. And part of the things they did was they would offer food to these idols, then they'd sell it in the marketplace. Some people had a real, had a real conscience about that. And it disturbed them deeply. Others didn't really care. And they're confused. There was confusion in the worship assembly. Paul takes one very long chapter to sort that all out. But what Paul was most concerned about was confusion and false teaching about the resurrection. And that's what he comes down on in this 15th chapter. Some were teaching there isn't any resurrection from the dead. Uh, these are like the Sadducees in, in Jesus' day. The distinguishing factor between the Sadducees and the Pharisees was the issue of the resurrection. Sadducees believed that there was nothing after this life. When you're dead, you're dead. And there were some people in the church at Corinth who were being influenced by that, theory, that thinking. And Paul says to them to not be deceived. The notion that there is no resurrection cuts to the heart, the very heart of the gospel. And this is why Paul was so distressed. He said about his experience in Ephesus, over the resurrection, he said, I fought wild beasts. It was not just a casual matter of opinion. Paul. It was the heart of the gospel. I had a friend in chapel when I was in college a few years ago, and a student spoke, and he just put it very plainly, very bluntly, without the resurrection, you rip the guts out of the gospel. That stuck with me for over 40 years, because it's true. The gospel is all about the resurrection. So let's begin in chapter 1, uh, chapter 15, excuse me, verse 1. And we're going to read to see, here see what Paul has to say about the resurrection. First of all, the resurrection is reality. It's not some fanciful idea. It's not a matter of opinion. It is the key, it is reality for our lives. It is at the heart of the gospel. Let's look at the first several verses, beginning in verse 1. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. You hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and they appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. For I'm the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. But if it is preached that gospel, that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? The resurrection is at the heart of the gospel. This is what Paul preached. He preached with great passion. First and foremost, he said, this is the first thing I told you was the resurrection. It is the heart of the gospel, the death, burial, and the resurrection. And this is what he says, we believe it is the core of everything we are as followers of Jesus. It is that by which we are saved. 
You cannot be saved apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead, the work of redemption that started on the cross was never finished. Without the resurrection, we're not saved. And he says, that's the thing we stand on. And this is what impassioned Paul. Because he had experienced it very personally. He understood what it was like to be on the other side. He understood what it was like to be an unbeliever. But when he came to grips with the truth of the resurrection, that became his life's passion. He was all about the resurrection. And so for Paul, the notion of no resurrection was unthinkable. It's just unthinkable. So it's the heart of the gospel that is also our reason for hope. And I want to read a little more, beginning in verse 13. He says this, If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we have been found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied above all men. That's our reason for hope. The only reason we have hope is because of the resurrection. There is no hope otherwise. If there's no resurrection, Christ hasn't been raised. If there's no resurrection, there's no Christ. He just a Dead person, a dead prophet, were there no resurrection. If there's no resurrection, we have nothing to celebrate. There would be absolutely no reason for us to be here this morning. We could be sleeping in or out on the lake. And he says that there's nothing to celebrate. Our preaching's useless. Just a lot of empty words. You're hiring a new preacher, he's going to be here in a couple of weeks. There's no resurrection. What he has to say is of no consequence. What I have to say is of no consequence. Our preaching is useless. And our worship is hollow. You see, the thing that brings power to our worship is not our musical skill or our tastes or the quality of our worship leaders. It is the power of the resurrection. There is no reason to celebrate. There is no reason to worship. There is no reason to preach if there is no resurrection. And here's the saddest part. If Christ has not been raised, we're lost. We're lost. Putting our faith in Christ, being baptized, trying to live a godly life, huh? No good if there's no resurrection. Our faith is in vain. And here's the killer. Paul says we're still in our sins. Because the power is not in our faith. The power is not in our repentance. The power is not in our baptism. The power is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we see the resurrection is reality for our lives. It's also redemption for our souls. Let's continue in verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first truth of those who fall asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Jesus is sometimes called the second Adam because what Adam in the garden started and fail that, Jesus succeeded. 
and that was to bring immortal life. Through Adam came sin and death. Adam sinned and he died. We all know the story. He rebelled against the authority of God. He thought he had a better way of doing it. He believed the lies of Satan. And because of that, he was banished from the garden and condemned to a life of toil and misery and eventually death. See, we all sin and die. Paul says to the Romans, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not a righteous person among us. In fact, the old prophet said, there's none not righteous, not one. So we're, we don't go to heaven on the basis, on the merit of our goodness, because we aren't good. The wages of sin is death. That's where we are destined to be. But it is through Jesus that we accomplish, or at least we experience, righteousness and life. Jesus Christ died for our sins. In 2 Corinthians, he says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God. And Jesus died for our sins, but he was raised for our justification. It is through his death that we are forgiven of our sins. It is through his life that we are righteous, that we are in a right relationship with God. He says to the Romans, He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. And I like this phrase that Paul uses there in Romans. He says, he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And here is the connection between the resurrection of Jesus Christ and our resurrection. He was the first to die and be raised to never live again. And those who have placed their trust in him those who have been followers of Christ, when they die, they will be raised. Now, I don't understand all of the ramifications of how that works. It's really kind of a mystery. But the truth is, the resurrection is redemption for our souls. Then there's one more thing that, uh, that Paul says. The resurrection is a renewal for our bodies. We're going to jump down to verse 50. I wish I could get into all the other stuff, but uh, we're going to look at verse 50 through 57. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all be asleep, but we will all be changed in a flash. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of sin, death, is sin. And the power of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's renewal for our bodies. We'll be changed. We'll be changed in an instant. Scripture says that the last trumpet, in the blink of an eye, everything will be changed. We'll be changed completely. Perishable will we'll put on imperishability. We're all perishable. You know, like a jug of milk that you leave out, it goes sour. We're going to go sour. We're in the process of doing that. We're perishable. And the mortal will put on immortality. We're mortal. Now, it's a mystery that is really hard to comprehend. And I encourage you to delve into these middle verses in this chapter. We'll look at that. 
but that is the faith upon which we build our lives, that we will all be changed. We'll experience final victory. Death will be swallowed up in victory. The deadly venom of sin will go away. The bondage of a law that could not be kept will not be held over us. Thanks be to God, Paul says. He is the one who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. One of my heroes in campus ministry was Roy Weeks. For many years, Roy was preached and worked in ministry in Missouri. Uh, his son, John, is now the senior pastor at Southland Christian Church in Lexington, where our, our son-in-law is on staff. I really enjoy listening to John because it reminds me of his dad. I remember the last conversation I had with Roy. I saw him at a, at a gathering. I said, Roy, how are you? Because Roy had been having some health issues. He said, well, I'm terminal, but I'm fine. You know why? Because he trusted in the reality and the renewal and in the truth of the resurrection. It's reality for our lives. It's redemption for our souls. It's renewal for our bodies. Therefore, Paul says this. And here's how we're going to wrap it up. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Three things to remember. Be steadfast. Keep your focus. Don't be distracted by things that are insignificant, things that are mortal, things that are perishable. Be immovable. Don't waver in your faith. Don't allow those who would argue against the truth of what you know to be the truth. Stand firm. Don't waver. And then he says, always be abounding in the work of the Lord. My dad used to say, keep on keeping on and be faithful even to death. When I retired from campus ministry, I did not retire from ministry. That's just unthinkable. Because the Lord hasn't told me to sit down. The clock is going to tell me to sit down in two minutes and 46 seconds. You need to keep on keeping on. And be faithful even to death. And your toil is not in vain. That's what he was trying to tell these people who were afraid that the resurrection was not real. He says it is real. It is all about the resurrection. And it is worth it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can believe what skeptics refuse to believe. That you died on the cross. That you were buried in the tomb that you were raised again, and you are the first fruits of all who have fallen asleep. God, I pray that we will hold on to this renewal, this truth, this renewal, and that we would live as those who have great hope, and that we would know that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.